بسم الله ان الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا يجعل المسلمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى عليه وصحبه أجمعين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأتلا شريك الله وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم What do we want to take away from our gathering today? Why did you come here? Why did you come here? And what do you expect and what will you take away with you when you leave? In yesterday's talk, we mentioned what it is that everybody wants, what we're all looking for. How many of you were here yesterday? Raise your hand. How many were here yesterday? Quite a few. Let me go the other way. How many were not here yesterday? Okay, and how many are not here today? That's what I'm waiting for. That's what I'm waiting for. Thank you, Greg Lester. Perfect. Greg Lester. Two bars. We'll make it through this. See, they told us, don't start the program until everybody is here. So if you're not here yet, raise your hand. I always have a few people will raise their hand. And I don't know what they mean. Maybe they're not really all here, if you know what I mean. All right. So alhamdulillah, beloved me. We talked yesterday about the subject of what everybody needs, what they want, how to get it. We covered that. For those that were not here, what we discovered is that every single person on earth, regardless of their religious beliefs or non-beliefs, they still have this one common denominator, this one common thing that's in all of us. We want security, we want safety, and we want peace. All of that in one word in Arabic, Aslama. Or Salam. Aslama is even more. That's the surrender, submission, obedience, sincerity, and then Salam. Amazing. If you told somebody that from the beginning, they'd say, oh, I don't need no religion. If you said it like that, if you told them you need Islam, they'd be like, no, I don't need that. But when they understand the meaning of the word, that's a whole different story. This is why we spent so much time working on that, because if we, as Muslims, have a better understanding of what it is that we're supposed to be doing, we implement that, and then we represent that with our lives, we don't have to say a whole lot. You don't have to say a whole lot. People understand right away. When you see a policeman in his uniform with his gun, his handcuffs, his badge, nobody has to explain too much to you. You see him, you got it. In the same way, when people used to see the Anbiya, the prophets, they would see their character. They would see the charity, the love, the conviction, the kindness. So you didn't have to explain a whole lot. Let me give you something.
from the advertising world, from the people that make the commercials on TV, radio, newspaper. They say that when you have to talk about something a lot, it means you really don't have very much. If you have to talk about it a lot, you don't have very much. The real dawa of Islam is not just what you say, it's what you do. When people observe us and they say, I want to be like those guys. I want to be like those guys. This is the dawa. Arguing, debating, long lectures, three hours, four hours. This means either you don't have a good understanding or your audience is not understanding what you're talking about. So we really don't need much. Now in today's program, what we want to do is take it to the next step. I'm going to ask you, why did you come what do you expect and what will you take away? Because if you're the same person that came in the door and the same person goes out the door, you gained nothing and we didn't either. But if you gain something from this conference, if something elevated you in your spirit, in your mind, and helped you in this life, and especially help you for the next life, then we all benefit. So again, what did you expect when you came in? What do you expect now? And what will you take when you go out the door? And this is the critical side. You're going to sit with the girls, huh? You know you got to have your job to do that. Just saying. In the same way that we were talking before about purpose, everybody has a purpose for what they do. So this is another subject that you can relax and talk about with anybody. What is their purpose? You don't have to be like a rocket scientist or a genius in Islam to talk about this subject. Just like you have a pen, right? You have a pen. What's the purpose of the pen? To write. Everybody knows that. You don't have to be a genius to figure it out. Somebody wants to borrow your pen, you let them borrow the pen. But you don't go very far. You stick around. You do with the pen. I need my pen, because I got to write something there. Can I, oh, thank you so much. Okay. But the minute that this pen doesn't write anymore, I don't need it. Is that right? It doesn't serve the purpose. Exactly the same thing for us. If we don't serve our purpose, what is our benefit? So what is our purpose? When the Almighty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, created us, He gave each one of us a purpose. And then He gave an, like an assignment of how He wants us to do it. Most of us never think about that. Most people never think about that. Even when they read the Quran and they go over the verse that says it, they don't think about it. Sir al dariyat Chapter 51, verse 56. I'm trying to sound like Dr. Zachary Nike with the numbers. You like that? Yeah. I will blame in the Shaitan regime. Wa ma khalaqtu jinn wal ins illa li abadun. Allah said, look at the negative. Look at the negative. He said, I did not create jinn in mankind. I did not create you guys except for ibadah, worship, worship, dedication, full submission. 
to him. And what's interesting, you find from psychiatrists, you find from counselors, psychologists, they will tell you that each human being ultimately has an object of their affection, something they love to the extent that they will do irrational things to serve that thing that they love. According to them, it's irrational. According to me, it's normal because all of us do it. If everybody's doing it, it's not, you can't say it's irrational. All of us have a dedication to something. Some people will tell you, no, I don't believe in God. So I don't worship anything. Really? Every single human being, and we discovered it in our program yesterday, every human being has this thing inside of them. They are going to worship something. They will do that. And if you said, well, the guy's an atheist, does that mean that he doesn't worship things in this world? Ah. Uh, many people, even those who claim to be religious, will worship things of the creation more than the creator. Start with education. Start early. Education. People want the education. For what purpose? If you said, I want an education so that I can benefit others, I want an education so that, you know, I can do some good things. Mm, that's nice. But if you just want the education so you're better than the other people, what is that? I want to have that straight A card. And I don't want anybody else to have straight A card. I also want to go to college, the, not just A college, I want to go to Ivy League, I want to go to Harvard, Oxford, Yale, I want to go to the big one, and I want people to know who I am. And then when I get through this, I want to get the right kind of job, social level. I want the big house, the big salary. Don't want a big wife, just a normal one, okay? <laughs> you know what I'm saying. I do that so you don't get bored, you know that, right? What I'm trying to make a point is that everybody will worship something. Whether it's knowledge, whether it's something in the world, something, they will put a value on it. And when they lose it, when they lose that thing, you watch and see how they act. Like something died. If they lose their wealth, some people will commit suicide. They lose their wealth, they lose their position, they lose their authority over other people, they commit suicide. Famous people commit suicide, yes or no? Wealthy people commit suicide, yes or no? Why? Because they lost something. They either can't find their purpose, they lost something inside of them, and it all goes back to this thing, that all of us are created to have that desire for something. So the key, mufta, is to find the correct thing that we are going to worship. And since we're Muslims and we already know the answer, it shouldn't be that we have to spend a long time talking about it. But because I want you to be able to go out to talk to other people, I'll continue on this for a few more minutes. When you open the subject with somebody about their purpose, you might be surprised to find how quickly people will listen, turn their attention, oh, what do you think it is? Because innately, many people have visited this subject and thought about it and said, you know what? I wonder, how did we get here? I wonder, are we supposed to do something? What am I supposed to do with my life? Does my life mean anything? Now I'm going to stop for a second. I want to warn you about something that you might hear from children. If you hear your children or your brothers and sisters say these words, be real careful. 
In fact, there's just one big word. If you hear it, be careful. Something's wrong. Would you like to know what that word is? Boring. There's a problem. A true believer is never bored. I want you to think about that for just a minute. If you're a true believer, you will always have things that you want to do. As a believer, we know that we are created to worship Allah. As a believer, we know that that's something we should be engaged in as much as possible. We actually accept the opportunities that present themselves like this. Many people get stuck in traffic. You're stuck. You can't move. The car's parked. What are you going to do? Boring. Turn on the radio. It doesn't work. Oh, man. What am I going to do? Sad. Sad. You don't even know Adhkar? You don't know Adhkar of Allah? You can't even say, Alhamdulillah. Even once? You can't say, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, even once? And look at the reward. Have you thought about the rewards? This is not a joke. This is not just something you tell children. These are real rewards waiting for you on the Yom Qiyam. Allah made it so easy, so easy to get these rewards. And he parked you there just so you could do it. And instead you said, boring. Mm-mm. The second thing that's dangerous is when our youth are so engrossed in other things that they don't want to stop to worship Allah. The television is going. Their favorite radio show is on. Some music is going on. And you can't even get them to stop to do Salah. No, wait, it's over. It's going to be over in 15 minutes. Oh, really? How do you know you'll live that long? And we're just asking you to stop long enough to do salah. And after the salah, what do you do? Now I'm talking to all of us, not just the youth. I'm talking to all of us. Every Juma, every single Juma khutbah, for the last 25 years, I saw the same thing. There's always a group of people who come right at the last rakah of salah. They don't even catch the khutbah. They time it just right. Hey, I can still make it. Yep. Okay. I run in, get in the line. Okay. Okay. Pretty much done with that. Out the door again. Can't wait to get to their car and... You know what I do every time we do a khutbah? After the salat, I take the microphone again and I say, Brother, sit there, stay there. Don't go. Because whatever you're going to chase for in this material world, in the hayat the dunya, you'll never catch it. Because the one, the one who created you, he can give you more than that here and hereafter. Just stay where you are and do like Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Worship Allah. Just five minutes. Five minutes. And you know what? Still they're running out the door. Still running out the door. Jumping in the car. Or worse, they just run out the door and step and stand and argue with somebody until the parking lot's empty. Did you ever see this? Yes or no? We all saw it. We all know what I'm talking about. Boring. Boring to worship your creator. Boring to spend a few minutes. What about the day of judgment? What's going to happen then? And by the way, you'll have nowhere else to go. You want to talk about boring? Worse than boring, the horrible reality that you wasted this 
opportunity, this opportunity to do what you were created to do. So you have a, a purpose. You are here. You know your direction. You know what it is you want. You know how to get it. But still, he lets you have that choice. You always have the choice. It's not automatic. No matter how much you know, the biggest scholar in the whole world of Islam still has a choice. He can choose not to do it. It's his choice. So again, I'm going to ask you, what do you think you're going to take from our program today? Because if you came in here to judge the people speaking by whether or not they have the kind of language that you like, whether it's local language, Arabic, English, whatever it is, or how they speak, how they stand, how they if you're doing that, you're wasting your time. Your time. We should all be trying to gain something from this experience. I should be, you should be. So that when we go out the door, it's not the same person going out that came in. Did I make a point here? Everybody understand that? Because this conference and other conferences like it are only effective if you're taking something with you when you go out. I'm going to compare you now, compare all of us, really, to a workman, somebody who works, physically works. So he goes in, in the morning, and he has a job to do. And then at the end of the day, the boss comes and looks at the job and says, you didn't do your job. Maybe he's a painter. You didn't paint it. Maybe he's a carpenter. You didn't cut the wood. You didn't put it together. Well, you didn't do it. And now watch. Oh, well, you know, the paintbrush was too small. The saw was not sharp enough. The hammer is not really heavy enough. The nails were, you know, not too big. And it was just, uh, and it was too hot. The sun was just, oh man, it was so hot today. <sighs> These are excuses, right? But I heard something when I was a small boy from a man who had studied his trade as an intern and then went on to become a master in his trade. A master of being a painter. My father hired this man and told him to meet me at 8 o'clock in the morning. We're going to paint this certain color this certain way and we're going to do that. My father was late. He was several hours late because he had something happen really important. When he got to the job, to the place where the man was, he said, probably the guy's not even going to be here, you know. Instead, the man was painting the house. And you said, so? My father had the paint in the car. My father had the brushes in the car. He even had the color match in the car. Because you have to match colors. The the can of paint was all set to go, to match it. How could this man be painting the house? And where did he get the thing to stand on? It wasn't a regular ladder. And my father said, how would you do this? He said, this is what you hired me to do. He said, yes, but I didn't, I didn't even bring the stuff for you. And that's when the man said these words. I'll never forget it. He said, it's a poor workman who blames his tools. It's a poor workman who blames his tools. The tools that your Lord gave you, are you really using them? One of the tools that he gave you was a heart. That's the first and foremost, because everybody has one. Do you use it? Do you feel? Do you feel for the people around you? Do you feel?
for those who love you and care about you? Do you really feel something? Are you using this? Then another tool. He gave you a mind to think. A mind that you can actually understand. Do you use it? He gave you the ability to connect the brain and the heart and to do what's called dhikr in the Arabic language. That is to use your brain and think about your Lord and say, Alhamdulillah, praise be to Allah, He has given me this day. He's given me this opportunity. He gave us this conference. He gave us these speakers who are coming here solely to help us get closer to Almighty Allah. Allahu Akbar. And your response right then was supposed to be what? Allahu Akbar. Yeah, come on. Wake up. Because this is another tool he gave you too. He gave you these two lips and lesan, the tongue. Use it before you lose it. That's another tool. So you have the opportunity. You have the tools. You have the understanding. Ask yourself the question, why am I not using it? to its fullest. I need to be closer to Allah. I need to be closer to my Creator. I want to be successful here and hereafter. It's not going to happen unless you choose to do that. You have to choose to do that. Not one time, all the time. In everything you do, when you leave out of here, when you go out that door, are you going to be the same person that came in? Or will you use the tools, use the opportunity to be somebody you'd like to be? Be the person that you would love to be. If you do that, if you do that, you will be successful. You will achieve your purpose. Be ready for opportunities. Don't call them difficulties. They're opportunities. Don't call these tragic moments. They're not tragic. They're opportunities. Read the seerah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Read the biography, biography of Muhammad Peace and blessings be upon him. Because in reading that, you see how he faced so many difficulties. But how did he handle it? I'll only mention one in the interest of time. Our prophet, peace be upon him, wanted to take this message to some of the people who were outside of the city of Mecca. He and a companion walked. And if you've ever been in this part of the world, you know what it is to walk there. They walked from the mountains of Mecca to the mountains of Ataif. Most of you know where the story is going because when I said Ataif, you know. And the tradition of the Arabs, even today and even before Islam, has always been hospitality. Anybody, even a stranger, shows up, they are in competition to give the best in hospitality. Not because of Islam, necessarily, just because that's our way. We're going to give hospitality. And if they hug you, I learned this from some Bedouin. If they hug you, it means for three days, you got a place to stay, eat. They're not going to ask you any questions. And the good part, they won't kill you. That's nice. Day four, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you should be going to another tent. But this is, this is the hospitality. And these people were an extension of his family. So these are also relatives. They are Arabs. They're relatives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Relatives of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he's taking his companion. He's going on foot and out of his way to go to these people just to tell them worship God alone without partners, without images, without statues. Just worship God. That's all he's going there for. 
He's hoping they will accept that and provide some kind of solace for them and backbone for them to carry the message forward in his own city because his own people turn against him. But unfortunately, some word had already got to the people of Ataif, kind of like the word gets around today. Before Muslims can have a word to say, the news brings it out. You know, the media, well, they guess they had their, they must have had some kind of media too. Because they already were talking against Rasul Sallallahu they didn't even know him. They were already saying things like, well, this guy thinks he's a prophet. I don't know, should we talk to him or not? Nah. Why not? Well, I mean, if he is a prophet, then we'd be messed up, right? But if he's not, why waste our time? Ah, ha, ha. And they were laughing. So when Rasulullah came, they did not even give him the basic hospitality they would give a stranger. Instead, they did something that is in the annals of history forever. They actually had the children of the street go out, the people of the street go out and pick up rocks and throw the rocks on Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his companion. And they threw the rocks and hit them until the blood was running down and filling up their sandals with their own blood. Chased them out of town. They were running from these people. And then finally they got to like a vineyard or something. And they stopped there. And while they were standing there, the angel Jabriel, Gabriel, the same angel who came to Mary, peace be upon her, the same angel that's mentioned in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Last Testament, came and told Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that God has angels on the sides of these mountains ready to bring these mountains down on those people. Hey, think about it. They threw rocks at you, we'll throw big rocks on them. How about that? Be honest in your own heart right now. If somebody had done this to you, had done this to you and your companion, chasing you out of town, throwing rocks at you, hurting you physically, and definitely ruining your dignity. How would you feel? And now the opportunity comes. Revenge! <laughs> Bring it on! Let me watch. Let me get my camera out. I want to get that. Is that what you're thinking? That's not what he did, though. Instead, look what he did. This is what I want to show you, the opportunity. The opportunity to use the tools that the good Lord gave you to raise your hands and pray for your enemies and ask Almighty God to give them guidance, to guide them to be in a better condition, to guide them to wake up to the purpose of their life, to guide them to be on that right path. And it's said that the one who opened India for Islam actually was from these people of a type. So you don't know how valuable your patience and persistence can be. This is another tool of opportunity for you and I. Patience, endurance, persistence. In Arabic language, it's called sabr. Sabr. I want to wrap this up just with that word. At that word at the end of the surah, al-Asr. Because we're almost at that time of the day today, aren't we? And it sure fits. It's a summary of a lot of the things we've been talking about. Think about this. A'udhu billahi min shaitanir rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wal as. Inna insana lafi khusr. Illa ladhina amanu wa amilu salahat. Wa tawassaw bil haqqi wa tawassaw bis sabah. I heard 
a scholar give a very good explanation in the English language. And I like to share that because that also is a beautiful tool is to sit with our scholars and learn from them the who, the what, the why, and the how. And that's why we came here today, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. The translation of the meaning plus or minus could be like this. Allah swears well, asr, by the passage of time. Time is something that you and I really, we talk about it, but we really don't know what it is. Do you know that? I look at my watch, it's a quarter to, oh man, it's not working. Ah, oh, man, hey, what time is it? Oh, it's, uh, it's a quarter after. Quarter after, whoa. But how long is it really? How long is a minute when you're sitting in traffic waiting, waiting, waiting? How long is that minute? How long is that minute when it's your favorite sport that's on the air and you're trying to say, whoa, back, gone just like that, right? Time. He said he's swearing by it. And ultimately, the time is with the law. Then he goes on to tell us the swearing by this time. He said, all of my creation of human beings are in the fire. They're losers. They're going to go to hell. Chusser means bankrupt. Someone is chasserin. These are the bankrupt people. They can't pay. And it refers to the day of judgment. Yamul Hisab. When you settle up your accounts, you can't settle it because you got nothing to settle it with. That's when you wind up in the bad place. Hopefully, that's not us. But that still is up to us, isn't it? Yeah. So, these people... Uh, so, but Allah goes on and tells us, Illa, except for those... Illa ladina. Except for those who come to the right belief, the right faith. La ilaha illallah. But he doesn't stop there. And then he talks about the muamala of the salihat. The good deeds. The deeds of the righteous. So to believe and do good deeds. Because your belief should have some good deeds that go with it. How do you say you got the right belief, but you don't have the right deeds? doesn't make sense. And then he goes on to say, What is that? The, usually the translators, they use the word like, remind each other. But I heard from the scholars that this is much stronger. It is to exert effort to encourage each other. Come on, man, come on. Let's do it. What is the haq? Haq, this is la ilaha illallah. Encourage each other to the haq of la ilaha illallah. That there is none worthy of worship except the law. And everything that goes with that. What to wassel be sabr. And encourage each other to sabr. Perseverance. Steadfast. And patient. And if we can do that. If we can do this. Follow this simple little formula. Maybe, maybe we'll find out that this life is not so boring and we can find many wonderful opportunities to excel and do so much with the tools that he gave us. Maybe. I ask Allah now that he will grant us that tawfiq, that success. I mean. I ask Allah that he will make us aware of our tools that he's given us. And I ask Allah that he will get us together. Another beautiful opportunity to be together in what we do. Overlooking the shortcomings of each other. And focusing more on the shortcomings of ourselves. If we could do that, imagine. Just imagine doing what we were created to do. Fulfilling our purpose. What a beautiful thing to think about. I want to wrap it up now with something that Allah said in the Quran. It's a beautiful dua. Most of you, I think, memorized it a long time ago. 
The meaning of it is that we're asking Allah to give us the real, true, higher goodness of this life. And at the same time, give us the higher, the goodness of the next life and save us from the punishment of the fire of hell. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasan wa fil akhirati hasan wa qina adhab al-nar. Amin. Amin. And by the way, that pen is still good, so I'm going to go pick it up. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.